Father in heaven, thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to gather together here and study your word. I ask a special blessing uh, now upon each one of us and special upon Philip, who is going to be sharing uh, the message. Uh, pour out your letter rain upon us uh, and be with us during this time. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope everyone was able to, to receive the notes. Um, some of you have the notes stapled as a booklet. Some of you like normal notes. The title of this presentation is called the law, the laws of the Bible. And when we think about the laws, the word laws, what I mean by this word is the same thing that scientists mean when they use the word laws of nature. In this presentation we will find out that just as nature has its own laws, the Word of God has its own laws. And we will find out that we can study these laws with the exact same methodology that scientists study the laws of nature. On the first page you have like some subtitles of, um, of this study. Uh, this is structured as, a, as an article, so at the end of the sermon uh, if you can, if you want to go and read uh, what has been presenting, you will be able to. The first part is called True Science. And in the first part, which begins in page two of your notes, we will analyze a quote from Sister White from The Present Truth, November the 4th, 1886, paragraph two. Those who have been attending Brother Parminder's classes might be familiar with this quote for we have read and analyzed this quote in the class. It says thus, To recognize God in His works is true science. To become acquainted with God in His providence is the soul of religion. Right? I would like to suggest that this is a, a repeat and enlarge. And I would like to suggest that true science is actually the soul of religion. And I want to suggest, or I want to urge every one of us to consider this, this aspect, that we are actually true scientists. And to know Christ as the world's Redeemer is to lay hold on, on eternal life as set forth in the Gospel. Yet the world in its wisdom knows not God. The footsteps of God can be traced in the works of His hands on all around us. But men who enjoy the benefits and blessings of God See not God in His created works, hear not His divine and stately steppings, and therefore they are in moral darkness. And there is necessity for channels of light to open the blind eyes, to unclose the senses, to unveil His attributes with messages from His oracles, that men shall not remain in ignorance of God and His majesty. I want to suggest that this quote teaches us that the primary way that God is revealing Himself to us is through His workings in, in the world all around us, through the workings of nature. But men, says in this quote, they have become blinded. So God, said, God concluded that it's necessary to send channels of light from his oracles to open the blind eyes. And what I want to suggest is that because men have been blinded by by the workings of God in nature, that is why God sent us his word. You know, because we are blind and we cannot see. And you, you can actually make a case and understand you know, in the beginning, patriarchs did not have any written word. They did not have a Bible. Right? How did they know God? I don't want to suggest they were worshipping nature or something like that. Right? I don't want to go to this conclusion. But they have somehow knew God without a, a, a written word, as we have. And if we just notice how uh, divine history or 
has progressed as men grew deeper in their blindness and their apostasy, so God sent uh, more and more revelations of His truth, you know, during all generations, because men have become more and more blinded. Every, the, the message of every prophet, uh, and actually I can argue that every part of the Bible has come, because in that time, the people of God were blind, they did not see God, Right? And God was able to supply for their blindness with a, like a stronger pair of glasses. No, they, they added some lenses because they were so blind. And we sometimes uh, like to indulge our, our, ourselves in this thought that we as a final generation has, have the most amount of light. But if you think about this principle, the reason we have the most amount of light is because we as the final generation are deepest in the, the trenches of sin. And the hand of God had to be st stretched the longest to grab us from there. Right? So, <clears throat> this is the, the point that I wanted to, to, to see from this quote. This uh, principle, meaning the principle that God reveals Himself through nature, is found on the bottom of page 2. We have Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Right? Day unto day the firmament of God uttereth, uttereth speech and knowledge. But we have been blind and we do not see that. It is easy to notice that God, in His revealed Word, uses net symbols derived from nature to teach us spiritual lessons. Right? I mean, we have, as a movement, we have been using natural symbols for a long time. We use, recently, we have been using the agricultural model more and more. Um, we all know about William Miller's 14 Rules of Interpretation. I don't know how many of us know that William Miller actually made a dictionary of prophetic symbols. He has over 130 prophetic symbols from the Bible, words that are taken from the Bible, which he defines using his own 14 Rules of Interpretation. And if you go and count and look at those words, symbols from the Bible, four out of five of those words are taken from nature, right? They're either natural objects or processes, over a hundred of them. So you can actually see how much God tries to make us look to nature and to try to understand His, his character, okay? And He's been trying to do this all through the divine revelation that we've been talking about. <coughs> now, um, I don't know if this is significant, but the way I see it, I, I try to I divide the symbols, the natural symbols in two categories. They're natural objects and natural phenomena or processes. The objects, you have a list here, page three. Um, fire, light, wind, sun, moon, stars, seed, grass. Wheat, tears, trees, water, ground, etc. A lot of natural objects. And these natural objects actually illustrate spiritual objects, like the human heart, or knowledge, or things that are kind of abstract to us, right? But they're spiritual objects. And there are also natu uh, natural processes, right? These natural processes, like the growing of the tree, of a tree, uh, the budding, Right, uh, the harvest, the latter rain, the early rain, uh, they illustrate spiritual processes like conversion or, I don't know, apostasy or other processes through which we go. Correct? I think we have been, a we, we are able to, to understand this. Now in the next section on page number four we want to look at what is the connection between the Word of God and nature. And this connection is most easily seen in a verse that is very famous in Christianity, and that is John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. You have it there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. Everything that we see, the nature, and I argue that the universe has been made through the Word. God said, uttered His words, and it was made. Right? In the story of Genesis, we, remem we remember that. So, we clearly see that there is... Um, and the intimate connection between the Word of God and nature, right? They, the Word of God is the source, and the, uh, na nature is the, the product, right? The Word of God is the cause, and nature is the effect. And in order to understand better the implications of, of this connection, you could use the following illustration. The Word of God is like an artist or a composer and nature is its symphony, right? It's when an artist creates, paints something or composes a symphony, what he actually does is he transposes his own mental patterns, his own ideas, his own worries, in other words, his own mind into his creation, right? Uh, you, you see this signature of every artist when you listen to a certain type of music, you know it's Bach or Handel, you know, you know this painting is from you know, Michelangelo or something, you know the characteristics of every artist by the art that he creates because he transposes on that art the principles in his mind. Thus I want to suggest that God, as the great artist, transposed in this symphony of nature the principles of his mind. And we've, it might make sense that the patterns of the mind of God, or the patterns of the Word, because Christ is the Word, might be found in nature. Wouldn't it make sense? It would make sense. I want to, in the next section, I want to look at three similarities between the Word of God and nature. The first similarity, and we will see they're actually not similarities, they're like identical, but we'll call them similarities. The first similarity is that both of them have laws. And we'll start with the easy one, nature. Right? We know nature has, has laws. We, we may not know what laws the nature have, and it's okay, right? But uh, what I want to suggest is that we take it for granted that it's normal that nature has laws. But I want to say it's not so normal. You know, just ask yourself, why don't the laws of physics ever change? You know, they stay the same. Why don't they change? No scientists ever have actually, you know, uh, realized or researched any, any kind of change in the laws of nature. They're all the same. If you have like a mathematical formula for a law, that's it. Everywhere, anytime. You know? And the implications of this is, um, is huge. It's amazing. If the laws of nature would change, First of all, we wouldn't be able to understand them. Because these laws of nature, how are they understood? They, they try to replicate the same experiment over and over again. They try to throw this stone to the ground, and then throw a, a, a heavier stone, and then throw it from a higher altitude, and they see that similar things happen, and they measure all of this. But if this law would, would change, if you throw a stone now, something would happen. If you throw it tomorrow or somewhere else, it would happen like something totally random would happen. And you wouldn't be able to actually make any sense of what's happening in nature. And I want to suggest some, something very interesting. I said earlier that it's okay if you don't know the laws of nature. Well, I was a bit misleading you because you actually know them. And you are not conscious of it. When you are born, okay, you learn how to crawl, and then how to walk, and then how to ride a bike, and swim, and play with the ball, and do all these kind of, 
kinds of complex physical activities. I want to say that walking, brothers and sisters, is a, is a physical process that is so complicated. Your, your brain it calculates all these parameters, like your body weight, your position, if you're leaning this way or that way, the, how the surface you're stepping in looks like, how the wind blows, everything it takes into consideration and it plugs this into a very complicated equation and it solves the equation instantly and when you step in your muscles contract the right amount of uh, force with the right amount of force so you don't lose balance right and you when you ride a bike this is even more complicated they you do things that you actually don't realize how complex they are and if the laws of nature would ever change, no baby would actually be able to walk. Because what our brain does when we actually try to learn how to walk or how to do anything, it makes like a process of trial and error. Like they try something and they say, oh, it didn't work. And then he tries something else until it sees a pattern. When it sees the pattern, it tries to learn the pattern it found in nature. And then apply it to the, to the different situation and that's, this is how you learn how to walk. I say that our body knows the laws of nature extremely well and it's able to solve this complicated equation with a, a rapidity amazingly, uh, amazingly fast. But we are not conscious of it. Now, even a, a person who doesn't know how to read can walk if he's healthy or ride a bike. You know, can do all this complex physical stuff even though he, he's not educated at all. So this is very interesting, this concept is very interesting, because we're going to use this concept a little, bit, a little bit later and make a spiritual application out of it. Because sometimes we are unconsciously smart, you know, and then we actually say we are smart when we become consciously smart. Okay. Um, so I want to suggest that the, the same voice that told or, or uttered the law of Sinai told the laws of nature, hitherto shall thou come and no further. Right? The same voice, the same, you can see the same pattern. Um, So the fact that, I think you can now understand that the fact that nature has laws is in itself a wonderful principle to contemplate. And now when we come to the spiritual world, or to the word of God, now we show that you know, nature has patterns, now we have to show that the word of God has patterns. And I think there is no need to comment on that. Because our movement has been finding patterns in the Word of God for the last 29 years. We've been doing that for a long, long time and we didn't even realize it. We've been doing the same thing as the scientists do when they study nature. right? We've been finding all these models, the agricultural model, the parable of the ten virgins model, the uh, everlasting gospel model, and we apply this um, these principles in three, uh, in, in, in all these different situations, and we see they have the same result. Now, this brings us to the second point, and the second point is that both the law, the laws of nature, and the laws of the word repeat from three different kinds of perspectives. First, and you have this at page 7 of your booklet, first they repeat in time. You know, I told you in the beginning, the laws of nature do not change over time. They are the same every time. And we have been studying in our movement that you know, the same law, the same reform line, I have something drawn there that you have in the time of Christ. You know, in that time you have in an this time, the time of Miller, you have in this time, the time of the 144,000, so we see it doesn't change by time, right? And then, second, they don't change in space, right? The laws of nature, 
wherever you are in this universe, if you are here in America, if you are in Romania, or if you are on the moon, the law of gravity will look exactly the same. So the space is not a problem, it's not changing in space. And I think this is the same with the, we can see that this is the sa same with the patterns, with the laws of the Word of God. You know, some movements have been happening in some place and some in some other place and it doesn't matter, right? In what place. And then the third one is very interesting. And that is the, the laws of the Word of God, they repeat, uh, I'll start with nature, the laws of nature, they repeat in scale. That means that when you have a law, let's say a law, the law of momentum, right? The law of momentum doesn't matter what it is, you don't have to understand it, but you have to understand that this law app applies to a single atom it applies to a speck of dust, it applies to a tennis ball, it applies to a planet, how, however big it is. So it doesn't matter the scale, like the same law applies to different scales, right? And the same is with the laws that we found from the Word of God. We have these different scales, we draw these different lines, some lines are big, like the, the sanctuary, sanctuary line, like it, it spans over thousands of years, and some lines are just a few years long, and you know, it's the same line, it, it looks the same, and this is where the principle of fractals is coming from. Okay? So you can now see that these laws, they repeat from three different perspectives. They repeat in time, they repeat in space, and they repeat at different scales. I hope that is clear. The third point, the third similitude between them, is that both the law, the laws of nature and the laws of the word create objects with striking similarity, yet each is unique. You understand the point? The laws of nature create objects with striking similarity, yet each one of them is unique. Let, let us... Can you give me an example, I don't know? Give me an example of something that is striking. Snowflake. Snowflake, okay, yeah, that's a good one. Snowflakes, you know? Like, they, if you, you can... How do you know they have a striking similarity? If, 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 if they are unique, how do you know they have a striking similarity? Well, you see, yeah, they're all white, you know? They're, they have some common characteristics. They, ha they follow a certain pattern. And this, this pattern, they all have in common, but yet they each have its own peculiar characteristics. You know, every snowflake is unique, every human being is unique. You're all unique, but you have the same pattern. Every tree uh, in the forest is unique. You cannot find two trees alike, but if you look, at the, uh, at the tree, you can immediately recognize that's a tree. Even though it's unique, even though you've never seen that tree before in your entire life. You just see and uh, that's a tree. You know, when I see a person I've never met before, I realize it's a person. I don't think, well, what is this? Is it like a person or... <laughs> it looks like a... <laughs> because I, <laughs> I immediately recognize it. That is because our brain is used to actually finding patterns into, into things. Our brains, this is how our brains are trained, to find patterns. We don't have, when we see new stuff, we don't have to learn what they are. When we see a new car on the road, we immediately recognize it's a car, right? Etc. So, this is very interesting. And then, <laughs> when you look at the, the laws of the Word of God, you know, we use that... <laughs> That quote from the Great Controversy 343, what, what does that quote say? That every great reformatory movement is identical to one another. Does it say that? It says it's a striking similarity. That means it's not identical, brothers and sisters. They're just like snowflakes. They have the same patterns, right? But it's not identical. They're similar. It's striking. You know, you can see them. You could see them if you have your spiritual eyeglasses on if you're not in darkness, right? You could see them, but <laughs> they, they, their similarities are striking. So I think this is very, uh, this is very interesting. 
Now, why is this so? Now, it's interesting, but why? I mean, if the laws of nature are the same, why, why everything is unique, you know? I mean, shouldn't, be, shouldn't every snowflake look the same? You know, don't they, aren't they subject to the same laws? Well, this is another very important thing to understand. I'll try to draw it for you, or to write it down. What a, what a law actually does, it takes an input, some, something, and transforms it into an output, right? But, and the law is the same, but if you change the input, the output will be different, right? And you can see this, I mean, I can give you an example. I was always say this example, if you drop a feather, it will fall like this, you know? But if you drop a stone, it, it will fall like this. They'll touch the ground with different forces. They, because there are different inputs. Okay? But the law is the same. So you have input 1, 2, 3, output 1, 2, 3. Different inputs, different outputs, the same law. The parable of the wheat and tares. You have different two inputs, wheat or tares, you know, but you have the same law. You have two possibilities, two possible outcomes. And I want to suggest that this is the very reason why the laws of nature, even though they are the same, they produce unique uh, out outcomes, you know, but they, although they have the same uh, common pattern. And we could go into another subject, <laughs> but it's too <laughs> on free will. But yeah, free will takes a part in that. Okay. Now, on page nine of our notes, I want us to, to analyze a quote Patriarchs and Prophets. Page 115. But his energy, this is God's energy, is still exerted in upholding the objects of his creation. It is not because the mechanism that has one been set in motion continues to act by its own inherent energy that the pulse beats and breath goes follows. Uh, breath, but every breath, breath, every pulsation of the heart is an evidence of, our, of the all-pervading care of Him in whom we live and move and have our being. It is not because of inherent power that year by year the earth produces her bounties and continues her motion around the sun. The hand of God guides the planets and keeps them in position in their orderly march through the heavens. Brothers and sisters, this is very significant. Because we tend to believe, and even if you don't study sciences, but especially me, because I studied science, I was tending to believe that, you know, everything is actually some fixed laws, and they ev evolve naturally because there are these laws. And we say God is evolved, but it's not really, you know, and it, no. Here it says, it says clearly that the hand of God pushes the planets around the sun. Well, science says that's gravity. You know, the gravitational force pulls them around the sun and so forth. You know, science doesn't say, say it's the hand of God. I don't want to say science is wrong in their conclusions. I think, I think they're wrong in their approach. Okay? They don't see it. You know, they just call it gravity. You know, but just think of the implications of this. Because if really the hand of God 
turns around everything, like every atom, everything that moves around. It's actually the hand of God pushing and doing it all around us. Because that's what this quote says, basically. Then, uh, just think about it. God is not a, like a robot, you know. He's not some kind of machinery, smart machinery that keeps everything in, in motion. Probably that's what uh, pantheism teaches, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to lead you to that, lead you to that. But just just try to put yourself in, in God's boots and take a bowl and take a smaller bowl and try to rotate them one against the other, just like the planets rotate around the sun. You know, and rotate the small bowl around its axis, just like the you know, Earth rotates around its axis and do this at constant speed every time. You know, it's gonna get, you're gonna get tired and bored and you're not gonna like it. Especially if you're gonna do it for a few millions of years, you know? So, so this actually tells us something about God's patience and His everlasting love. He actually decides every second that He's gonna push that planet according to His everlasting principles. He could say, oh, I'm tired, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna change the principles. He could say, because He has free will, He could do that, if He wanted. But yet, He never does that. Every time, He just does the same thing, you know. And I think that teaches us a very important lesson about God. And then, if you, for, if you look forward again into this, you will be brought to another conclusion. That actually, because we usually, maybe we believe, we formalize our thoughts in the following way. Like, what we do here is the hand of God. Like, these reform lines are the hand of God, they're spiritual, we like to use these spiritual expressions like the hand of God, the divine symbol and everything. But if we look on the other side, uh, nature, they're, they're lost, they're different. But no, this, this quote says, nature is the hand of God and we know that um, the reform lines in the Bible is the hand of God. And that actually means that the laws of the Bible are actually the same as the laws of nature. Before I told you they're similar, but they're actually not similar. They are the same thing. We were not comparing two different kinds of fruits. We were looking at the same kind of fruit only on a different side, on a different facet. Okay? They're the same laws because they're being pushed by the same hand. I was thinking about this for a long time. I was wondering whether these, the laws of nature are actually different kinds of laws, and I was seeing the similarities, but I was wondering if they're actually the same. And I think these answers, they're actually the same, you know. And another quote which confirms this, page chapter, uh, page number 10, uh, you have in the upper part of the page a quote, Christ Subject Lessons, page 33. He who gave, talks about the parable of the sower, he who gave the parable of the tiny seed is a sovereign of heaven and the same laws that govern earthly seed sowing govern the sowing of the seeds of truth. It doesn't say it's similar laws. It says the same laws. That means that they're the same, the same hand, the same laws. Okay, this, is, this has very profound implications because it means that when we study the Word of God, we actually really study science. We really study true science. Amen. It's not some kind of nice word that we'd like to, you know, associate with us. And we actually do some kind of magical, mystical things, drawing these thing, lines on the board. And, you know, it's not anything like that. It's really science. Time flies. I have here parable teaching. I don't know if I'm going into that. I, I'll just read the quote, page 11. In Christ's parable teaching, the same principle is seen as in his own mission to the world. 
So you have one principle, the same, one. And that principle is seen in his parable teaching and is seen in his own mission to the world. Okay? That we may become acquainted with his divine character and life, Christ took our nature sorry, and dwelt among us. Divinity was revealed in humanity, the invisible glory in a visible human form. Man could learn of the unknown through the known. Heavenly things were revealed through the earthly. God made manifest in the likeness of man. So this is his mission. And then, so it is in Christ's teaching. These are his parables. The unknown was illustrated by the known divine truths, by the earthly things which, with which the people were most familiar. We know that Christ, at the beginning of his ministry, used to speak in parables, and then, uh, sorry, in plain language, and then he started speaking in, in uh, parables. And uh, this quote says that the principle, whatever principle you find in the parables, you find in his coming on the earth. And I would suggest that that principle is actually not only found in his coming on the earth in that time, because we know these laws repeat, you, you actually find that principle in every reformatory movement. Every reformer is actually the embodiment of the same principle that Christ used when he came on earth. You know, the principle of parable teaching. And what is this principle? What is a parable? You know, a parable is something that you look at, you look at, let's say, you look at the seed and you think about the Word of God. You know, that the seed is representing of the Word of God. The seed is a parable. And what Ellen White is explaining here, that in the same way you look at, as, at the seed and you understand to be the Word of God, in the same way you look at Christ, who is human, in His uh, appearance, right? And you understand of, the, of God, of the divine. And in, this, in every generation, God designed a, a method for the people of that generation to be able to see and comprehend the glory of God and yet live. And this method is the incarnation, is the combi combination of divinity and humanity, who is the same as the parable teaching. Because in every generation, man of God, you know, ate the little book and went to them with carrying the message to a lost church and they were actually representatives they were parables of God the same way a seed is a parable of the word you understand now and this is why Christ actually said to his disciples said that if ever any man receive you or reject you, they receive or reject me. Because they were actually to become parables of Him. Okay. Pa page number 13. We're going to still be in the realm, realm of um, parable teaching. But we are, I really want us to understand <laughs> to understand what understanding means okay what what does understanding mean it's a, like a play of words understanding means knowing the meaning of something right i looked up on the dictionary this morning oh that's what knowing the meaning so you look up on the dictionary and you are trying to understand what a word means and you have this word And this is the definition. Like this word is... And what do you find in the definition? Other words. But other words which are... Do you have the word synonyms in English? They have the, the same meaning, right? And I'll call them S synonyms. And it gives like some synonyms. S1, S2. And it gives some expressions which are also synonymous with it. Like S3. Right? This is how you explain a word. Now, I want to say that this can be viewed like this. Word. And then S1, S2, S3. You see? Line upon line. 
they actually have the same pattern. And one is explained by the others. That's why we say on the testimony of two, a thing is established or explained. Okay? So there, I think we can begin to come to grasp what understanding means. Understanding, brothers and sisters, means nothing less than being able to find patterns within a set of data. You have some data, something, you look, you're looking at something, doesn't matter what it is. It can be a musical symphony, it can be a human being, a forest, everything. You look at something, you look at the Word of God. And if you are not able to find patterns in that thing that you're looking at, it means you're not able to understand it. Because simply you are not able to give other examples. You know, this is a pattern. You know, it follows this word, is this word, is this word, is that expression, is that expression. And if you're not able to do it, it means you actually don't understand it. That's what science do, does. You know, f f biology. You know, it divides the w natural world in different kinds of animals and plants, and then uh, uh, the animals are like mammals and other kinds of animals. And they're all divided or understood by their patterns. So biology is able to see patterns in nature and then group things according to their common patterns. And the same is, like, let's say, psychology. Now, psychology studies the behavior of man and it's able to say, well, the temperament of man is of this kind and of this kind and of this kind and they divide mankind into different kinds of temperament based on the common patterns. And if you are not able to actually find patterns in what you study, you are only reading it. Most of the people when they're looking at nature, they don't understand the patterns of nature or not consciously understand. Because I said you unconsciously understand so many things. But consciously you don't understand them. You look at sunset you, or you, you wonder and you see, wow, it's so beautiful. But you actually may not understand that the same law that makes sunset happen makes a, a stone fall that when you drop it is the law of gravity. You may not understand all of this. Yet you are still able to behold that glory and say, wow, it's wonderful. No, but because you are not able to find any patterns in it, you're just looking at it. I want to say that regards, in regards to the Bible, if you are not able to find patterns in the Bible, you are not understanding the Bible. You are just reading it. And I believe in this time of this earth's history, the only people that are actually able to understand the Bible is this movement. Amen. There's nothing, nobody else. They all read it. They just watch it and say, wow, it's nice. You know, but we're actually able to go there and get patterns out of it. What, why, what, what do you use those patterns for? Why do scientists try to find these patterns? Well, they are trying to make predictions, accurate predictions, and they now got to the level where they can predict like an eclipse a hundred years away to the second. And he can tell you if, if you're staying in this place in exactly a hundred years and that many days and that many seconds, an eclipse will come. And it happens to the second. And they're able to predict the storms. And we're doing the same thing. We're taking the Word of God, looking at it, understanding it, and then being able to predict the storms which are coming. Amen. Now, how is this connected to the parable teaching? Oh, it's so connected. <laughs> Page 14. The last quote, the long one, from, the, from Matthew 13. Therefore, says Jesus, speak I unto them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and they hear, hear not, hearing, hear not, and nor 
neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Just like most of the people look at nature, and they see and, uh, the, all the wonderful things of nature, and they hear the songs of the birds, but they do not understand and perceive anything. They just look at it and admire it. That's how the Jews in that generation view the Bible. And I want to argue that's how Adventism look, looks at the Bible today. For these people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart. Understanding. Right? They have to understand the parables of Jesus. I want to suggest they were tested upon their understanding. Jesus was talking in parables to see if they were actually were able to take the effort to go and study the, these parables and understand their meaning. I mean, see patterns in them and in nature. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Likewise, brothers and sisters, our generation is tested on whether we will understand or not the parables of the Bible. And I want to suggest that the Bible is only parables. Like, it's full of parables. You know? And as I suggested, the only people that I know of, I don't, I don't know if there are anybody else, the only people who are actually doing this are us. And this has great implications. We are so privileged. We have been given so much light when we actually don't even know the implications of what we're doing and how meaningful. We have just been, we have been unconsciously in understanding everything. Do you understand? Now, the, the illustration that I was making with the body unconsciously understanding these laws, we've been unconsciously doing everything, you know, and it's wonderful. Unfortunately, Satan has been devising methods within Adventism to uh, prepare uh, the way that when God is, will send a message, that will actually unseal or understand the Bible for them, they will reject it. And this message from, from Adventism says, well, there are actually no patterns in the Bible. God actually adapts to the changing times and situations. And these people are, are likened, or I liken them, in page 16, the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, 9. These are these people. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But those who will understand these parables, are represented in this parable, in this, the parable of the sower, as those who are the good ground. And about the good ground, it says, But he that received the seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. You know, the first one do not understand, but the good ground understands it. Which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, I want to suggest that every generation ha has actually been tested on whether or not they would understand their Bibles. But I think the, the generation which has been blessed, as I said in the beginning, with the most light is our generation. Right? Christ... I want to make a short uh, side note. I think I forgot to tell you this. When you understand the laws of nature, 
you will you you are actually you will actually be able to write all the laws which describe every phenomena that ever existed on the universe on a sheet of paper that's this size you know all the laws everything can be explained on with some formulas that and then they are readable they're not like tiny text like you know 10 formulas or something like that and thus I believe that nature becomes a little book the size of a sheet of paper okay and that's how the Bibles our Bibles are actually going to become a little book because we will be able to we are able to actually see the patterns we need within it and just compress it to just those patterns you don't need to see all the sunsets in the world in every country and every day you just need to understand how the sunset works right and this is an encouragement for those of us who believe what am I gonna do this message is getting so big and we will not be able to comprehend everything and <clears throat> well yes you will not be able to memorize it and everything or even read everything but you shouldn't do this you should just look for the patterns and understand them well and when you see a sunset you see lo behold the pattern of a sunset right that's what we should do we should not strive to get information and just memorize it memorize it copy and paste it in our minds we should understand and be intelligent beings not some computers memorizing or video cameras memorizing images right because that's what we are being tested on we're being tested on understanding and there is this there is this misconception in our movement I hope I'm not gonna be get too much in trouble for doing this <laughs> that we, we now begin to predict some things in the future like our close of probation and we came to the conclusion which I think is correct that is very close you just number it within years right and people are studying wow what am I gonna do I have to prepare I have to prepare for this event I'm not prepared what am I gonna do well I think this this is a an honest concern I, I don't want to blame those persons but I think that that's not how it works Amen. because just look at the parables that we most often use look at two parables the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the wheat and tares we say that the seed is pl uh, planted here right we say this is the preparation the plowing preparation we say this is the harvest and this is the rain this is the time when the seed is growing Amen. but if you look at the in the parable from the moment the seed falls into the ground can it actually change its course no. it's already set from the moment I know it's a hard saying but from the moment it's planted into the ground its evolution is forever set what this period does this period of rain is actually a progressive demonstration of character we used to say that character is demonstrated at the third step and we think oh at the third step we're gonna demonstrate our characters well I hope you don't imagine that when the probation closes in that day you're gonna start you know doing some uh, horrible scenes you know to demonstrate your character you are actually demonstrating your character all the way through and I get that at this point the demonstration culminates at the harvest no I don't I agree with that no but I want to add the fact that the, here it's the demonstration of character because this is the testing I want to write here testing and the same thing is seen in the parable of the ten virgins 
The virgins prepare here. And then here, they're in their homes. They gather oil. And here they leave their homes. They go forth to meet the bridegroom. And we know here the door closes. So from here, from the point they leave their home, they cannot, even if they try, they cannot change oil between themselves or you know, try to uh, get some more oil. This is only a progressive development, uh, demonstration of character. Now I get the, the fact that in the parable of the wheat and tares there is a maturity, a process of maturity. You know, I don't deny that, that we are becoming more and more mature in this process. That's another story. I want to give you another example from the real world. Take a, any exam. Right? You have an exam, you prepare for the exam. Here the exam starts. And then here you write down everything you learned. And then here the results are revealed. It's revealed whether you actually passed or failed. Now this may seem a contradiction to some because they say, well, wait a minute. You said that you are you are supposed to understand here. Right? This is where you begin your understanding. Well, don't you understand things before the exam? Well, no. Because the exam is about understanding. The exam is not about memorizing things before and writing them down on a sheet of paper, writing as much as you can. It's about your ability and your willingness to actually understand the Bible. And here is the preparation for the understanding. <clears throat> here your understanding is tested. And here you, the, re, the results are revealed. And the, the results are revealed when you're going to have your exam in front of the synagogues and the kings of the earth. And they're going to listen to you whether you are actually going to be able to speak in front of them or not. That's your exam. So, the expression that, oh, let me prepare. You should already do this now. This is what we should do. We shouldn't desperately look forward to a point in time I, uh, uh, while actually not, or, or actually neglecting the preparation of today. We know it's close, right? And it is even closer than when we first believed. But we should focus on doing this, right? Okay. Oh, I have two minutes. Um, I want to go fast through some things that I have. Uh, you can read them uh, in your own time. They're in the article that you've been handed out. And in our reform line, I want to suggest this is 9-11. And this is close of probation. Okay? In case you didn't realize. Um, if you look in, the, in, in 1 Corinthians, it says that there, the, the Apostle Paul, in I think in chapter 13 and 14, it says that there are two types of understanding, the childish one and the mature one. It's, he says that when I was a child, I understood as a child, but now I'm, I'm mature and I understand as mature. And he says in another uh, verse that be not child in your understanding, be mature. right? So you can actually define these two processes of understanding, the childish understanding and the mature understanding. And I want to say that the childish understanding is that unconscious understanding that we've been talking about. Is that you are actually, you actually understand, but you are not conscious of it. It's like your body understands things that, and you do them, but you don't know how things actually work. Right? The mature understanding is when you actually become self-conscious and you start to understand in a real sense of the word understand the methodology and find patterns in the Word of God. I want to suggest that 
I have drawn here three lines. You, you find them in your notes, the same drawings. You can see this process illustrated in three lines, at least. I think there are more lines, but these are, to me, they seem the most clear and familiar ones. This is the, bap the, the baptism of Christ, right? The divine symbol comes down. And this is the cross. After the cross, on the road to Emmaus, the disciples started understanding. It, it really uses this word. And he opened them the scriptures and they understood. Something like that. This is the word understanding <clears throat> on the road to Emmaus. And this understanding that they actually had, it's like their eyes were opened. You know, I don't know what, how, how their eyes looked. They were closed or blinded or they did not see well here. They understood some things. They knew that Christ was the Messiah. They were the disciples of 9-11 but yet did not understand fully their mission and what they were actually doing. You know? And then they got matured here and I think this, I want to suggest that this maturity is actually what prepares the way for the Pentecost because had, had they not actually understood they wouldn't have been able to uh, experience Pentecost. And that is why we have understanding which, which is childish and mature and this is paralleled by the early and the latter rain. Okay? And I want to suggest that before the cross they were walking by sight. They see, saw Jesus. They saw, they were confident in their, what they were doing. But then they learned to walk by faith. If you go to the Millerite line, this is the divine symbol coming down. This is August 11, 1840. And this is April 19, 1844. At this point, they revised their understanding. Just as the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they turned back to their Bibles and actually understood what those prophecies meant. And this led the way to the midnight cry, just as the disciples' understanding led the way to uh, the latter rain or the Pentecost. Okay? And before this, they were walking by sight. They had the 1843 chart, the visual test. They were walking by sight. And after this, they were walking by faith because they were disappointed and they were in the tearing time. And Habakkuk says about the tearing time that the just shall live by his faith. Faith begin here, April 19th. The just lived by his faith. And in our time, this is 9 11. This is 2014 and this is the close of probation this is the early rain this is the latter rain and it makes sense because the early rain is a childish and it's a lesser so to say understanding of, of the Word of God but then when the latter rain comes, the mature understanding comes we start actually under, turning back to our previous history and we start um, understanding what we actually meant when we said some things. Mm -hmm. Did you see that happening in the recent times? Did you see persons who've been going back to our past history and they actually uh, updated our lines and what we actually meant when we said some things and some things? That's what we've been doing. We've been maturing in our understanding. And, oh, I want to add something. Uh, just Forgive me for going over time. But I think it's important. When you, when you go into elementary school, right? They teach you about atoms, how atoms look like. And this is just an example. I, I could give other examples. And they teach you that this is an atom, this is the nucleus, and the electron is rotating around the nucleus, just like the planets rotate around the sun. And you are being taught this in elementary school, in high school, you know. But when you get to the university, they actually go and tell you, hey, let me tell you something. This model is actually wrong. This is just a vague approximation of what's in reality. You know, let me show you what it actually looks like. 
And they show that actually electrons, they are very interesting particles that they teleport from one place to another. One time they're here, and the next time they teleport here and here and here. And you actually have, if you measure them, they're actually in some random places around the nucleus. And the real image looks like that. And I could give other examples. This is childish understanding. This is mature understanding. The mature one does not necessarily contradict the childish one. So when you see people actually going and updating what we do in our lines, they're not actually moving the way marks or contradicting what we, do, what we did in the past. They're actually confirming that what we did in the past should have happened. Because had we been shown this model from the beginning, nobody would have actually been able to understand it. The, even those who teach in in elementary school, they know that atoms look like this in reality. But they still deliberately teach their, the kids this model because that's what they can understand it. We were just like those kids. We had this childish understanding. Okay? And I want to end with a very interesting thought about faith. When scientists do predictions, they actually use the same faith that we should use. They know the patterns of nature, and as I said, they can predict, let's say, a, an eclipse a long time after this time. Exactly. They can predict the trajectory of a rocket, they can predict so many things. And they do this by faith. They don't realize it. I remember I had one teacher in the university who was jokingly telling me, we are actually prophets. And when he told me that, I actually thought about it and I said, well, I think you're right. <laughs> you're actually prophet. <laughs> so th that's what actually opened my mind and I, I started seeing those things. So when we are actually talking about faith, Hebrews chapter 11 is the chapter of faith. And it, it says that faith is the substance of things unhoped for, the evidence of things unknown. Some unseen. unseen. Okay, thank you. I want to pick up on the word evidence. And I want to say that faith is based upon evidence. The faith that scientists use in order to make prediction is not, based, is not something that comes out of thin air. They just think, oh, I decided I'm going to believe in that. And I, I know that if I believe strong enough, it will happen. Faith is not like a placebo effect. It, like you take something and you really, if you really believe it, it's going to happen, you know. It's not that. Faith is actually having evidence and comes only through understanding. If you're not understanding those patterns, you will not be able to have faith. And only people who actually have the privilege of having faith in our generation is this movement. Now we actually can have faith because we can understand those patterns and through that faith we can make predictions and through that faith we can set our lives in order so that we can meet that storm that is coming. Let us pray. So, um, before I got here, you know, I was waiting there on that chair and I was trying to get through my mind everything that I want to say. I was trying to think about everything so not, I don't forget anything or something. And while I was thinking, I, I got an, uh, some idea, some thoughts that I didn't have before. And I thought they were really interesting. <laughs> but then I forgot, I forget to tell you about them. And then at the end of the meeting, I told Brother Jeff about them. And he told me that you forgot to tell them the punchline of your presentation. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, just, a, just a short recap. You remember that we, we were discussing the concept of uh, understanding, right? So understanding means being able to find patterns in whatever subject you're looking at. And we were seeing that our movement has been understanding the Bible. We've been finding patterns in the Bible. And I want to suggest that what, what we've most specifically been doing, we've actually found patterns into prophetic events. Like we have prophetic events, we have event one, two, three. And then we see, oh, wait a minute, we have again event one, 
two, three. And we have all this progression of events, right? But we have noticed that they're actually one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You get the concept. And then we've made this, we've cut this and this through the middle, and we made them what we call reform lines, okay? So that's what our reform lines are. Finding patterns into the history or into prophetic events. So these are prophetic events. But what we seem to have been doing recently is not only finding patterns into prophetic events, but finding patterns into time. We've been, try we've been able recently to understand time. And you can, now you can view this, one, two, three, one, two, three, not as prophetic events only, but time. One, two, three, one, two, three. Do you see this? Okay, 120, 391 days, 120, 391 days. So, <coughs> what we are doing right now, we're understanding time, not only the, the prophetic events. Like, we're not only putting the, 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 the prophetic events in order, into patterns, we're putting their timing into patterns. And I think what we do is, even though we, we, call, time set, we call it time setting, I think it's a bit different than uh, what the Millerites used to do when they were time setting. You know, they were taking some prophecy from the Bible, like the 2300 days, right? And they applied it to a certain period of time. We don't seem to do that anymore, right? We don't look at the Bible and find some like 70 year prophecy, 70 and say, well, these apply to the end of the world. We don't do that. We just take the symbols, and I would argue we, oh, anyway, we, we just take the symbols of, let's say, 70 and 126 and other symbols which are derived from the, from the Bible, and we look for them in time and we are able to find them repeated over and over again in time. Right? So, we are doing with time the same thing that we've been doing with events. It's very consistent. It's not like, like that we've been somehow changed the direction of the message. We've just enriched it. Right? We've, ju we've just been able to see that, wait a minute, we can look now at time and see that you know, there are so many 9-11s and so many <laughs> 120s and uh, so many, so many. So I thought that was interesting and that should actually confirm that what has been happening, what has been presented here is actually of the same nature as um, the reform lines. It's the same nature, it's the same methodology uh, that's behind it. And we can see that our time setting, yeah, our time setting is based upon the lines. It's not based upon the year day principle. And that's why we're different than the Millerites, mm -hmm. right? We have the, we have the lines. We have, we, uh, in this concept, the lines, I, would like, I like to call them patterns, right? We based, Millerites weren't looking at patterns when they were uh, working out their time prophecies. We are looking at patterns, okay? Uh, and there's other, uh, another idea that maybe you remember the, the, the diagrams that I've been showing you. Um, with uh, childish understanding and mature understanding, maybe the Millerites were having a childish understanding of time, while us seem to have, uh, begin to have a more mature one, to really understand time in its fullest sense. Okay, so that was it. Heavenly Father, 
we stand in awe when we see the amount of privilege and light that you've been giving this movement. We are so gra graceful and thankful for, for what, what you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, and we know that in the same time this is a fearful responsibility that you've placed upon our shoulders. There is no people on earth that you have given this amount of light and understanding. May you help us that when next time when we use the words faith and understanding, that we may actually really mean faith and understanding and we may actually grasp what that those, those words mean. May you help us that we understand the Bibles so that we can be able to give the prediction having faith which is based upon evidence. We ask a blessing for the rest of this day and for the events that are going to happen. We thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen.